Morning, guys. I got the clicker. I got here very late last night, so I might not be my most coherent. And I was hoping you guys would have this all figured out by now, so a bit disappointed to learn we've got to crack this code today, but hopefully we'll be, uh, we'll be great by the end of the day. So um, what I thought I'd do was just give you a few pieces of sort of provocation and some tools that we use in our work. Um, our mission at Futera is to make sustainability so desirable it becomes normal. So we're looking to make it desirable, sexy, appealing, glamorous, tasty, healthy, whatever it is, it's gonna drive that desire for the receiver of the message. And normal is a very deliberate choice also. We don't want this to stay in the niche. We want it to become mainstream. And I'm just gonna show you a few ways that we think about that and a few tools that we use to get there. And then just a couple examples to hopefully illustrate the point. Um, we were working with a client last year and together we cracked this little uh, formula for movement building. We spent a long time looking at how you deliver what we uh, allude to as MFSC, Massive Something Social Change. Um, and really it comes down to this, this very simple formula, people plus passion plus plot. And I'm gonna to focus today on the people and the plot part because people, it's really important to know who you're trying to reach with your message um, because different folks have very, very different um, things that are gonna work with them. And then plot, because um, that's where your narrative falls. So people, think of that as you've got the one, the 10, the 100, and then the million. Um, and you kind of need to tip through all of those to get to a movement. Um, passion is about unlocking that passion. Often that happens in movements when you get to that point where things go from being something that um, people are kind of suffering in silence and they come together to be collectively outraged um, and then to agree that we need to do something. It goes from being this kind of private injustice to a shared injustice. And then plot. And within that we have frame, really important how you frame the message. Um, and then obviously all the ways that you bring this to life for your audience. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about people and then a little bit about, about plot. Just to give you an overall example of the formula, you might just think about, for example, the gay rights movement. It's been around for now you know, decades, been through many incarnations, had one of its most recent breakthroughs um, around the marriage equality uh, piece. And what was interesting to note, I think, about that is that where the unlock came for that was when we reframed it from being about gay rights to being about marriage. And we reframed it from being about um, you know, a lifestyle in the, in the point of view of those who oppose gay rights to being about love, a fundamental human right and a fundamental human truth. They were able to boil down the essence of their entire movement to one hashtag, love wins. And that's how simple we want this movement to be. You need to elevate this to somewhere where it becomes a fundamental human truth, almost impossible to argue with, but aspirational and inspirational. So those are some of the sort of just overarching principles. And this is how you can see the people and passion and plot kind of can all mesh together to create that change. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm going fast because I don't want to like hog the stage here, but this might be a useful, um, a useful sort of tool in the discussions this afternoon. So this is our very high level segmentation study um, working with a group, um, it's called Values Modes. And broadly what this does is it divides the population into three groups. They're not equal quadrants, which is what they look like here. Um, the greens and the bricks are less than 20% each of the population and the golds are 60%. Let me tell you a little bit about these groups and why it matters. So green pioneers, let's start there. I'm gonna be prepared to guess that a lot of us in the room today fall into this segment. These are people who live in a very, very big world. They feel very connected to big global issues, climate change, global poverty, um, they, they're very passionate and fired up and they want to be the change they want to see in the world. So this is the group that's often the people trying to lead the movements, particularly in the sort of sustainability environment space. Um, but you can, you can think of this group in other major social movements as well. They're the kind of the, the inner circle. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the brick settlers. So if the Greens live in a very big world, the bricks live in a very small world. It's about me, my family, my community, my church group, my PTA. And that's where they focus. Foreign countries and things happening outside of their community are almost hypothetical to them. They almost don't really, they think they're mythical. They almost don't really exist because they're so focused right here, right now. And um, this group would be in often in very strong opposition to the Greens because the Greens will be saying, how can you be so focused on, you know, litter on the streets in your community when the ice caps are melting? And the Brexit will be saying, how can you care about the ice caps when there's litter right here on our streets? So, and you can probably think about, you know, how these are not political uh, segments, but you can think about how they kind of do tend to fall uh, along those lines. Um, you know, these folks, the bricks crave safety, 
um, belonging, the Greens are much more interested in change and hope. The, the single biggest change, uh, difference between these folks is that Brits believe the past was better than the future, whereas Greens believe the future would be better than the past. Um, so those are kind of the two groups, and often those groups hog a lot of the limelight, and they're kind of the two groups that we may right now be most focused on. But I want to call your attention to that, that gold prospector group. That's 60%, roughly, of the population. And this is a very different beast. So if the Greens live in a big world, the Brits live in a small world, the Golds live in a world that's all about me. It's about social status. It's about being cool, being in the know. It's about what do people think of me. Um, and these people, they love to shop. So for major brands, they're often the big consumer. Um, what's really important for us all in this room to understand, though, is this group also sets the trends. And so if you want to create a movement, you have to understand how to connect with Golds. And another point to make here is that the messaging that works for Golds is fundamentally different from the messaging that works for the other two groups. So I'm just going to try and oops, leave that there. Just going to try and make uh, make this work. I'm going to try and do a little experiment here with the. So what what we did as an agency was we took we looked at um, how would you message around solar panels to these three different groups. And I'm going to see if we can make this work. This is how you would sell solar panels to green pioneers. Do you care about climate change? Do you care about our planet and the people on it? Do you want to be the change you want to see in the world? Well, solar panels. Okay, got it? Heard okay? All right. How do you sell solar panels to brick settlers? And people used to think this couldn't be done, right? Because it's clean energy, it's green energy. But as we now know, and probably folks in this room do know, it can be done. Are your electricity bills running amok? We take control with the oldest and cleanest energy around, the sun. These panels will save you money, which is why your neighbor just installed one. See the difference? So, so far, so kind of good, but now, this is the one that I hope is really gonna blow your mind. And it's the one that often um, those of us in the Green Pioneer Group have the hardest time embracing because it feels to us like selling out. Okay. Solar energy is hot. These ultra high performance panels are available in black, pink and limited edition platinum. They will be noticed. I've spent a lot of my career in rooms arguing with nonprofits about the value of marketing and having them look at me like I'm a charlatan. But I'm here to tell you that if you want people to embrace your message, you have to do some things that might feel to you like selling out because you need the golds. Nobody follows greens, unfortunately, as we all know. We do not set the trends. The golds do. And so we will achieve our ends much better by understanding how to reach them by then continuing to try and argue them into agreeing with us. So we've got to get it out the rational and into the emotional. Just a couple more pictures. You know, often we're talking at uh, Google Earth level. People live at Google Street View. We've got to bring it down to Earth and into their day-to-day -day lives. And just one final example. Um, we had the opportunity, and Dan, you know this because I talked to her about it before, to work with UNEP on a campaign about um, species extinction and, and wildlife trafficking. And we looked at all the messaging that was out there on this, and this is basically what you see. A lot of really disturbing, oh, sorry, that's not the one I want to show you. Let me just go through. A lot of really disturbing imagery about these you know, magnificent animals who've been destroyed. This really pushes the buttons of a green pioneer. Man, we are going to be fired up and ready to go with this. But the goals are going to tune it out. It's too difficult. It's too complicated. And if I associate myself with you greens, I'm going to look like one of you, and I don't want to because, sorry, you're just not cool. And I, I am a green, so I'm putting myself in this. So this is the campaign that we created. Um, this is Giselle Bunchen, the, um, the supermodel, um, and the campaign was called Wild for Life. And we, we thought about how, when do people care about these species? Um, there was Cecil the lion, and there was Satow the gorilla, I think it was. And you know he had a name, and he was one individual. Um, and we also thought about the, um, sorry, we, so we thought about that. We also think about when people con connect with animals, have you seen all those, like, um, who's your spirit animal? Which animal is your spirit animal quiz? So we literally created a spirit animal quiz for rare species. So 
I could take this test and find out that actually I was a pangolin. Who knew? And then I could create this social media filter where I said, I am Freya, I am a pangolin, so I'm giving the animal my name, I'm bringing it down to one. And the UN was able to bring all their goodwill ambassadors to, the, to this campaign. So we had the likes of Giselle, Li Bingbing, these very aspirational celebrities, you know, leading this campaign forward. The campaign reached over a billion people. Um, it's by far the most successful campaign UNEP has ever done. Um, and, you know, can success hopefully continuing to roll. We don't yet know if it's done anything to um, ratchet back on the wildlife trafficking because we just don't have those results yet, but fingers crossed. So that's just a little bit of provocation for you in how to think about how, who we want to connect with, the importance of knowing who those people are and then, and then how to reach them. I'm happy to see that um, this, our, our talks um, dovetail nicely, un, unsurprisingly. Last time we spoke together, we all just j went into a conversation about what our spirit animal was, actually, after that. So, um, <laughs> I was cheetah. Very cheetah. Great, yeah, there it is. So um, good morning, and it is a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly talking about narrative. So um, Freya was talking uh, about at a messaging campaign, very important level. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit because, uh, and, and really starting here, what's all this fuss about narrative? Um, I love Jeff's introduction, and, and yes, I operate at the branding and marketing level, and we, we do a lot of what we call narrative work. And I feel like I've seen a change in the last few years because it, it wasn't long ago that we would uh, have conversations with people and, uh, and talk about narrative, and we got a lot of quizzical looks, and, you know, or perhaps even sympathetic looks, like, that's very nice, darling, but we're doing important work over here, and take that fluffy stuff somewhere else. And suddenly I feel like, and it's just anecdotal, but I'm seeing narrative everywhere, particularly after November, Everybody wants a narrative, right? And it's one of those things. And there it is in the Meadows Memorandum, which is wonderful. And, and, and I, there have been people all along who understand the value of narrative, and, and Hunter obviously is one of them. But I think we are at a time where it's one of those buzzwords. We're having some semantic saturation. People are throwing it around without really understanding what we mean when we say well, we need a new narrative and why do we need a new narrative particularly when we have so many beautiful facts and we, in this room, love our facts. I've never seen so many smart people. We spent the last few days, very inspirational by the way, but talking about all the facts that we have uh, in our favor. So why can't we just tell people the facts? Um, and I'll, I'll get back to my um, friend and, and most long-term client, the Honorable Mr. Gore, who probably has more facts at his disposal than any human being on the planet and loves them more than any human being on the planet. Um, but even he has evolved. So, so why can't we just tell people the facts? Um, there, the research on this actually just keeps getting more and more interesting, but these are just some of my highlights in, in the work that I've done. And at this point, the one on the left there, influenced by Cialdini, is like the granddaddy of a lot of this. And he was the one who really put a marker in this idea of social proof, right? And this idea that when, in particular, when things are complex, changing, or new, we don't look within to make a rational decision because all we see there is ambiguity and complexity. So we look out. We look to see what others are doing. Yes, we do. Um, and we don't think that we do it, but by golly, we do it. So when you see today in a hotel the card that says, 95% of our guests are reusing towels or on your energy bill here in Boulder, how you're comparing to your neighbors, that, that stems from that work, right? So then moving on to the one in the middle, Kahneman, um, this is an amazing book. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. It was a bestseller, which is just so cool that this Nobel winner could take 20 years of research and turn it into a bestseller. And I'm shorthanding here, but he's the one who came up with this idea of system one and system two thinking, um, which you might have heard of. And system one is the one that is the overachiever, snap judgment, always at the ready, 
uh, making quick judgments. And system two is our more rational system, more laborious, more analytical, and needs a cup of coffee in the morning to get going, so it's always lagging a little bit behind. And the result is that we can feel as if we're being really rational, but often it's system two just backfilling on system one and those snap judgments, right? So he operated at a brain level. And then the last one here, just if, if this is a newer book, it was actually just translated in English, um, and now he has a follow-up, but this, this was beautiful. So he was going further than a brain level, he was looking at evolution and going all the way back to when there were actually competing hominids on the savanna. And there was no guarantee that Homo sapiens were going to be the ones, really, to, to survive and, and have premise, uh, primacy. And he attributes our success and our thriving and our ability to survive to one thing. And it wasn't language, because a lot of others had language, actually. And Neanderthals actually had bigger brains. Um, and other species even have language. But we had one thing. And I, I love this so much. You know what we had? We had the ability to tell stories. We could imagine things that weren't there, that weren't physically manifest in the world. And we could conjure a metaphor and a vision and get others to believe it and then collaborate and work to build things. And that is called community. And it also became culture. Because the real power in this was that we could shortcut thousands of years of evolution that others would have required simply by changing the story we believed in. And that can happen overnight, as we see, for better or worse, right? The story we believe in, it's the basis of religion, it's the basis of nation states, corporations, et cetera. Okay, so by now, hopefully, um, you've been influenced because everybody's talking about narrative and your neighbors are talking about narrative. System two, hopefully by now, has kicked in and done a really good job convincing you that you're very smart to believe it and our survival depends on it in this case. So. Are you in? I'm in. OK, we need a narrative. Um, so what makes a good narrative, though? Um, because any parent can tell you that when you tell a bedtime story, the kids can be a tough audience. And we're talking about convincing the world. So it can't just be any narrative. It has to be a good narrative. So I wanted to just do just a very quick spin. And this gets much deeper, but a few things. And Jeff alluded to some of these, and I, I love that you did, because it can be a lonely place sometimes. I start here. This seems like it should be so obvious, but I can't tell you how many times in a meeting, and actually Freya alluded to this as well. This is the point where particularly progressives will say, well, we don't need to engage in trickery, <laughs> right? And I have to say that when we talk about narrative, we're not talking about a fabrication. We're talking about storytelling. We're talking about framing things in a way that people can see things in a new way. But it's out there. It exists. So I sometimes like to think of it as a constellation, right? The stars are all there, but we're connecting the dots in a new way to tell a new story. Because the fact is, the old stories are the ones that can become lies. And there's been a lot of talk about this GDP, for example. It might have been useful at one time. and it. It would, but it becomes ossified, and then we, it becomes a presumption, and nobody's questioning it. And those old ossified narratives can block new narratives from forming. So in this type of crowd in particular, I, I would love if we could get to a place where we weren't so apologetic about messaging, and we had some confidence about it. It is true. It's rooted in truth. You don't have to apologize. You don't have to feel bad about this. We are talking about the truth. And the next is simplicity, and Jeff also alluded to this. Um, simplicity is important um, for many reasons, but my God, we love our complexity, and um, yes, we do, yes, we do. And all of those points of view are important, but once again, it's like we're among friends. It's, I, think, I do think it's a little bit of a progressive disease. We have to include everybody's point of view. We have to include all the nuance. You know, the narrative is one place where a little bit of perhaps reductive reasoning is, is actually helpful because if you include at the onset, at the beginning of the conversation, every single point of view and nuance and, and audience, et cetera, it's not a narrative, it's a poo-poo platter, okay? And <laughs> it is. And so it's about altitude and it's about discipline and it's about making choices and that can be hard, but those are, by the way, all the secrets of good branding, right? And so all of the other stuff gets in there. It's just at a different altitude. And when we do these exercises with people, we literally boil it down to a very simple framework. It's one page. And when you articulate your vision, you don't get pages, you don't get a paragraph, you get one sentence, right? Just as to your point about love wins. These days, frankly, you should get a hashtag. 
Um, and, and then, and that's your vision level, and that's about, that's rooted in emotion, it's rooted in values, et cetera. And the other stuff fills in, those are your pillars, those are your proof points, again, this is rooted in truth, but it's about what foot are you leading with, and how do you create that moment of abruption, right? And then finally, there's this, and again, Frey alluded to this, aspirational. I mean a few things by this when we say aspirational, and one, if it's not clear by now, it has to be emotional, it can't live only at this rational level. But it also, very importantly, you have to be for something, not just against something. And being able to articulate this is very important, right? When we talked about the fact that community is so important to us, it literally, our, our survival in the past depended more on which side of community you got right than, than climate change, right? So we're hardwired that way. And we all want to be on the winning team. We all want to be on the right side of history. Nobody wants to be in the dusty cul-de-sac of culture. You want to be in the thriving, exciting heartbeat of something that is thriving and winning. And so now I will circle back all the way to, um, the, honestly, I, I joke about him, but, um, you know, Mr. Gore, who I hold in such high esteem. And yes, he loves his facts. And it's interesting to be sitting here 10 years after Inconvenient Truth came out. And of course, Inconvenient Sequel um, has been screened now a few times and is going to be in wide release at the end of July. So 10 years. And a lot's happened. And when he started 10 years ago, he had to be gloom and doom. And he was the guy carrying the sign saying the world is going to end. Because he had to put it on the map. And he saw something that nobody else did. And he hammered those facts. You know, and then along came some filmmakers who said, hey, you could do some help with the narrative part. And, you know. Um, but then something else happened, and that was that the issue evolved faster than his predictions and anybody's predictions. What we thought was our grandchild's problem became our problem, you know, and, and in Miami now it's flooding on sunny days, and here in Boulder we had a tropical storm that, you know, in the Rocky Mountains, and suddenly it's here, and we risked tipping from it's not happening to it's too late almost immediately. It's stunning if you think about it, right? So the denial shifted and we had to shift the narrative. And working with Al to shift the climate narrative has actually been, that's, I'm not gonna take credit for a personality change, but I will say that and both Rob and I have had the luck to work with him on this. And if you look at the difference in his presentation today, he spends half his time on solutions and he spends much more time talking about what He's for, and that is with great intent. So what was being against climate change is now being for a clean energy economy in which we all can thrive. And that is something that we can show momentum on, we can show small wins at a local level, we can show mind share that, that people are happy to share the, some positive news as opposed to negative. It's all of those things that Freya was talking about. Um, and by the way, it also is true, simple, and aspirational, right? And so that's the shift. That's the kind of thing we're talking about when we talk about a, a narrative. And I'm going to pass it to my friend. I uh, I have very little to say after these two just went. So um, don't look at that screen yet. Uh, I, I will say that uh, I, I have a funny memory of when that shift in the narrative for the Climate Reality Project happened. And I was in New York, and I split my time between Boulder and New York these days. And I'm in the basement theater of the Angelica Theater, and I had just watched the film No. Has anybody seen that at all? It's a fabulous film, I totally recommend you seeing it. And it really focused on um, what was going on with, in Chile around the uh, Pinochet regime. And what happened uh, was utterly fascinating. So he had put on the refer uh, a referendum on the ballot to get another term, right? And he essentially was a dictator who had co-opted democracy uh, in, a, in a, an attempt to sort of appease, uh, you know, the American, America as a supporter. And yet he was, the country was essentially being run in a, in a terrible way. Uh, prison camps, families being separated. I mean, everything you associate with your sort of typical dictator and uh, evil dictator, excuse me. And so what happened was, is that it was, this, it was a referendum that, had a, that, that was put out for a vote and a vote for yes was a vote for 
him getting another uh, term. A vote for no was, of course, that that doesn't happen. And um, you know, and the, and what happened with O was that the the fear that went through society, like people did not want him to have another term. Yet everybody was terrified to actually vote against that. And even voting no sort of uh, suggested something you know pretty negative. And an advertising person uh, at the time was sort of brought into, you remember this, right? Was kind of brought into this clandestine secret group that was, that was gonna be given equal airtime because in those days, you know, campaign finance was not a big deal as it is now. And um, so, so in, in each side was given equal airtime on television. I mean, how fabulous would that be, right? Um, so, so the group had uh, created imagery that was that showed basically all the atrocities and all the horrors. They had grabbed secret film. It was black and white of the of the camps and of of uh, all the horrors and people being separated and um, and killed and whatnot. And they realized they needed somebody to come in at a little bit more expertise. So they sort of drafted this guy who was an, who was an ad guy. You know, and it's '70s and it's Chile and it's not exactly a. Uh, you know, it, you know, there there was sophisticated advertising going on. There was television. There was film, newspapers, and everything else. And the guy, well, the guy comes to meet with them, looks at the campaign that they were proposing to put on the air, and it was like, "You're going to lose. You know, you're going to absolutely lose this one." And he said, "You need to show people hope. You need to capture the imagination. You need to show people that if they vote no." that they are voting for a brighter, sunnier future, you know, Skittles, Pepsi, and rainbows. And, and that is, uh, and everybody was resistant, and eventually, I'm not gonna give away the whole thing, it won out, but the, but, but the thing that was really fascinating about it is, some of us probably know what the end is, and the end is, is that no won, because it captured people's imagination, it stirred their souls, it gave them a bright light, and uh, you know, in a shiny place to go for, Pinochet, of course, declared the election a fraud. But then what happened was is that even his military heads were so impacted by that campaign that they turned on him and said, no, you're out. And I, I walked out of that film. And I didn't even know what I was going in. I just saw it. It sort of got some good reviews. I, I, I walked out into the basement of the Angelica. And I couldn't get a cell signal. But I was furiously typing emails to the Carthage group to anybody like who I was working with saying, holy shit, you know, something is happening here. And, and then we cut to, I think a few weeks later and we were in DC at, um, uh, you know, at, at the Climate Reality Project offices. And we're sitting in, a, Al was there, and we were sort of going through what our next communication strategy was gonna be. I think you were there too. And, and uh, he, there's this person in the room who I didn't recognize, and then Al introduced him to all of us as Davis Guggenheim, <laughs> the maker of the film. So everybody had sort of been, you know, parallel pathing on this, and it was absolutely fascinating. It was sort of then that the narrative switched for the Climate Reality Project from doom and gloom to uh, a position of hope and a, a, a place where we could sort of come out and really talk about the movement through very different optics. And, and I think that's really sort of where it kind of, where, where the narrative turned. And I thought that that was a really fascinating thing. And of course, only Al Gore would have the maker of the film in the room with us to, um, sorry. But, I, but one of the things I, well, I guess there's uh, seven or eight things I wanna talk about. And, and most of this was covered off, but I, I like to sort of get down in nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of, of kind of how movements are really made. And I come at this, by the way, um, not so much as a beautiful writer like Danier and um, who came out of journalism. I come at it from a place of ruthless marketing. And, <laughs> and it's, you know, the, somewhere in my, in, in my own narrative that, that changed uh, to do more social impact work. But, you know, I'm very focused sort of like on what's the nitty gritty of kind of like what moves human behavior, what changes opinions. and and there's some key ingredients of, of a movement up here. And, and some of them will be familiar, and some of them might not be. But, and, and they were captured, but I'm, again, it's nuts and bolts. So you really have to define the change or the goal. And it's really important to do that. And you know, one of the great failures of Occupy Wall Street was that it was essentially just a giant list of grievances. And with, 
they had the people, they had the passion, they had the real estate for a couple months, you know, but they, they had a lot, that's exactly right. List of grievances and that's it, and it just got watered down. And it probably discredited um, a lot of what was going on out there. In fact, I think that the liberal and progressive movement took a step backwards because it was so poorly organized. Um, who are our people and how can we meet them where, we, where they are? It's important that we don't just shout from the rooftops, shout from the streets or speak up you know, in, in, in book club or in a poker game or whatever. Um, it's, it's really important to go to where people are. And I think that there's a tremendous danger of, of us not really understanding who the audience is. And I think that's really gonna come up here because as we move into, I'm watching time, okay. Um, I, th I think it's, it's, it's very, very critical that we as a group and that this narrative really define who we are talking to here. You know, do we need, you know, for example, do we need to really convince the left wing? Probably not, you know. Where, where most of our work is gonna be done is probably somewhere in the center. That's just a, a gut, a hunch, right? Where we're not gonna, we've already got enough people. It's like how campaigns are run these days, right? Most of the money, the billions of dollars in campaigns is not to convince Democrats to be more Democratic or Republicans to be more Republican. It's kind of in the middle. It's the undecided, it's the independents, but it also takes place on the fringes as well, right? So it's sort of getting people to kind of coalesce to a place where we can find shared values. And it's important to really talk to the people that we believe are on the fence, tippable, or the ones that we think might not be tippable, but you know, they're somewhere out there and they actually care about some of the values that we have. They just don't know it. They've been talked out of it. Um, take a damn stand, you know? Again, back to the Occupy Wall Street thing. Take a damn stand. I would use the F-bomb, but I, you know, I wanna be very sensitive to everybody here. That is really important. A soft, watery stance does not work. The stand has to be crystallized and it has to be emphatic. Um, identify our adversary. You know, I think we, in the, uh, in the progressive movement, I think we sort of identify the av adversary and then we make them monsters, right? Sometimes you don't have to make them into monsters. Sometimes you just simply need a foil, something to sort of bump up against and you don't need to throw daggers and shoot them with bazookas and stuff like that. So that's important as well. But having an adversary, that's like a key ingredient to any great story. It's like, you know, somebody, there's a hero, something was, over, something was overcome, um, but it's important to sort of note that. Uh, provoke and inspire a conversation, I think we know very well how to do that, and I think it was covered off here quite well. When you provoke and inspire a conversation, um, don't get so in the weeds that you have uh, dinner parties like at Jeff's house and, you know, <laughs> right, absolutely. Provoke and inspire, but do it with clarity and simplicity and create shareable content. This is my ruthless marketing guide coming out. The content's gotta be interesting. It's gotta be, um, it's gotta be, we call it, you know, the old term is sticky. Um, there's a whole bunch of rules for what makes content sticky. I'm not gonna do them today, but it's definitely important to have content that people are really excited to share. And uh, you have to energize the influencers, as, as you talked about, the golds, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's critically important. And one of the reasons we've made such good gains, I think, on the climate movement is because um, a lot of influencers, and that's Hollywood celebrities, and Leonardo DiCaprio, to um, you know, to people who have huge YouTube followings, to you know, teen shows. You know, it's sort of gone up and down the the age ranges and demographics. But there's a lot of influencers in the movement now, and that is really helping quite a bit. Um, I was at a thing with uh, uh, Ban Ki Moon last fall, and he joked that on a good day. Um, giving a speech from the UN, maybe he'll get 100,000 people on live stream, who knows. Uh, and, and after all this work, he signs Leonardo DiCaprio to be an ambassador for the climate for the United Nations. And he goes and he tweets something out and it gets like 10 million you know, followers. He's like, I, you know, I have to use influencers. He's like, there's no doubt for us to get anything done. And that one was on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which includes climate. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, at, the, at the very bottom, it does have to be simple. And I agree with you. I think that the LGBTQ um, you know, movement really was galvanized by the whole notion of a simple message, super duper simple. And it wasn't just that hashtag love wins. What they did is they reframed the conversation to, be, uh, to go from 
uh, gay rights to love and commitment. And what happened there was that people in conversations, how, how do you say no? How do, how do you as a Republican say no to love and commitment? It's almost impossible. So anyway, a lot of other ingredients. I lost my slide there. Um, now, what we have in front of us are some big challenges, right? So let's say we do all the right things here. We create the narrative. The narrative is beautiful. It's simplistic. It's sticky. You know, it's, 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 you know we've got everything it's sort of going, and, and we're like ready to march, okay? Well, since the Powell memo in 1970, what, 1973 was when it was released, though, right? Wrote, was 71. Um, we had a very different kind of media landscape. And if you look at then, there were four TV channels, right? There were the three major TV channels, and then one might argue a UHF channel or a PBS channel sort of floating around, right? Um, and if you were in Chicago, where I grew up, it was Channel 9, where you watch the Cubs, or it was Channel 11 for PBS. So I'm not giving it five. I'll give it three plus two half channels. Um, and now what you have are 500 plus TV channels just on your cable box alone. But what, importantly, what you have are millions of digital channels that are out there, right? And it is, it, it's a tremendously uh, complex landscape, and I'll, I'll actually demonstrate that. I'm gonna move pretty quick here. Um, in terms of news, there were three news powerhouses, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and now there are many news sources, right? And what's going on is they're super complex, and to a certain extent, they're bifurcated and polarized now because of what's going on in politics. And that is yet another place we really have to, um, to, to sort of look out for and be aware of. Uh, back in those days, it was free radio everywhere, right? Now it's satellite, digital, podcasts, more, right? And, and, you know, O'Reilly gets kicked off one channel and the next day he's got a 10 million following on Sirius or something, right? So, you know, the, things are changing and they, and they continue to change. And newspapers and magazines, they're still out there, thank God. I mean, it's nice to have paper and um, have that sort of tactile experience reading. But the truth is, is that most uh, news that is contained in newspapers is consumed digitally now. You have digital subscriptions, you have freemiums, you have apps social media more, and uh, that landscape has changed tremendous, tremendously as well. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with this. You probably saw it. I thought this was one of the better slides that, uh, that I had seen. And so when you're looking at media, this is a terrific look at kind of, uh, if you look at the x-axis, we, we have sort of liberal and conservative, and then on the y-axis, we have journalistic quality. And you can tell that this was written with a slight liberal bias uh, at the time because Fox is fairly low on the uh, quality <laughs> axis. Um, but what you see is you have a bunch of uh, newspapers and, and, and media uh, you know, sources and outlets that kind of circle, that, that hover around the middle. And it gives you sort of an, an idea of what a game plan could be with the Meadows Memorandum, right? And if we decide that we wanted to, for example, lean left, that would make sense, correct? Go talk to who's listening to us anyway. Um, you know, we'd certainly be over in the, if you look up in the slates, the Atlantics, the Guardians. Um, as you move down, you know, some of the very neutral ones, the big three. But I think what happens that's, that's really interesting is as you go down to USA Today and CNN, which I might argue, this slide was put out before, um, before the inauguration, and I think after getting kicked out of the White House uh, briefing room, CNN sort of moved deliberately to the left as a kind of an FU. Um, I don't know if they would straddle that, you know, sort of perfect middle ground like they like they used to three or four months ago, even. Um, and and um, but it, but it's also very important that we navigate. So if we're going to meet people where they are, and we figured out that our audience is somewhere in the middle, that's likely where we're going to head. It doesn't mean that we would leave out the left side per se, but it certainly means that um, we would tailor our messaging and we would tailor our communications and our, you know, our simplistic message to a place that we felt we could be heard and that we would be received. But again, it's just another demonstration of kind of what's going out and sure it shows the whole notion of this sort of, it's a bifurcation, yet at the same time, we still have stuff going on in the middle. Um, this is a slide that I've shown about a thousand times, I think, in, in various uh, presentations or, you know, when I'm at dinner and I just want to, like, throw it out on the table. Uh, no. Um, but, you know, years ago, this was sort of the social sphere 
of a fairly active um, social media influencer. And this is just a graphic representation. Uh, and what you can see is you can see sort of, really, if you wanted to count each one, you're, you're, you're at about 1,000. And that's somebody with you know, probably what I would call a light social footprint. Um, I would argue that today, um, this is somebody in their 30s or 40s, maybe even 50s. You know, the, the complexity of our social systems has just increased more and more. And it's really hard to think about kind of an audience in a two, in a, in a one, in a unidirectional way, a, um, or in a conversational way, in an engaging way in social media. It's now really what you have to think about when you message is almost in a, you have to think about it in a spherical way, right? It's so complex. And, um, and uh, our friend Michael Slaby is going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of the day because uh, he's building a platform that takes into account this, this extraordinary complexity uh, of, of communications channels and how you really need to kind of thread a movement. Um, and then one last one that is always fun. These guys, if anybody has ever seen this, these Lumiscape people have just been, I don't know, they've been like crushing it on the internet for anybody that's in marketing or digital. And it, what this slide shows you again, it's just simply a demonstration of the complexity of, of weaving uh, messaging and distributing content, and so on and so forth, um, where most of us, you know, where most people in this room will probably gravitate and find some familiarity is the lower right, which is really the media side. And, um, you know, but you can start in the middle, you see the usual suspects, Microsoft, Google, Yahoo. AOL, but as you move down into the right, you'll see Disney, you'll see News Corp. Um, you love News Corp, don't you? And, and, but it's not just the media that we have to take into account when we are creating our movement and, and, and putting our messaging out there. It's all aspects of this. And, and so as a marketer, we need to think through sort of what the back channels are. It's sort of like what's the back, state, back of house, if you will, um, that gets us to be able to propagate our messaging uh, front of house, if you will, to in, into different media. So um, again, just to illustrate that it's very different than 1971 now. Very, very, very different. And messaging has to be simplistic, but at the same time, from a relevant standpoint, it has to be nuanced um, so as to be meaningful um, and, and to a certain point conversational. I think that's it. So thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so we're gonna ask uh, for questions if you have questions. Um, we're gonna have one rule around those questions. Second, we'll take a microphone to you so we can get it out there. Um, how many people have been at conferences like this before where question and answer looked a lot more like pontificate and comment? <laughs> we're gonna ask you to, if you get the mic, to actually ask a question, simple, short, direct, we know you're an expert, you don't have to explain it. <laughs> we just, just your name, and this is my question. Uh, and, yep, so we're gonna, there's one right there, you can pick it up, just turn it on. Um, one piece I just wanna say that's a little bit provocative before we start to open to questions. If you had to pick the one thing that is causing us the most amount of problems and causing us to be the least effective at messaging and communication, what would you say that is? Just gotta guess, I have my theory. Complexity? Who else has got an idea? Money? Uh, you must work for a nonprofit. <laughs> Gil? <laughs> Confusing self expression and strategy? Projected fear? Lack of a joyful vision? Uh, ben, way in the back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> they do, don't they? It, yes. Demonizing people we need to enroll. Okay, here's my thesis. And I, I could be wrong. My wife would tell you it happens all the time. <laughs> the single thing that makes us the least effective is that we're right. And when you start with the basis that you absolutely are right, we absolutely know that climate change is a problem and we absolutely know that, I mean, pick your issue and you're passionate and you know you're right and you have the facts. It doesn't, that 
come from does not make you an effective messaging person. It, it is, it's just a boat anchor on messaging. It doesn't matter if you're right to be an effective messenger. So with that, who's got a question? Thanks for being here. Um, how do we galvanize the resources to craft the narrative that does all the things that we know we need to do in settings where we are complaining that we don't have enough money to do this and et cetera, et cetera. How do we, how do we collaborate to create that national or international narrative with the right amount of resources? I'll, I'll, um, I'll, 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 I'll take one for the team here. Um, I, I just want to remind you of some movements that were successful that required very little money, right? So if you look at Tahrir Square in Egypt and um, what happened, I mean, that, that, those were sort of like I would call the early days of social media movement making. Um, and that was all earned media, not paid media. Um, yes, it always helps to have a campaign. It always helps to be able to say, okay, I've got some money for Facebook and you know, <laughs> do some advertising and tweak and adjust. But one thing to not forget is that um, if we can't line up beside, behind a single focused message, um, you know, we might be, we very well might be able to achieve what we want to achieve in sort of what we call the earned media space. And, and I'd say that the uh, LGBTQ um, movement uh, was, you know, there was funding, there is no doubt. However, what happened was is they created a sticky hashtag that was basically um, passed around. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, I wouldn't, pretend to know all the answers there, but just to build on what Rob was saying, the, the power of what we call earned, which is to say, you know, we're not, not paid, right? Um, you can boost a lot of that with, uh, I, the word, to me, the word permeable comes to mind. So a top-down message costs a lot of money, but giving people something that they can grab a hold of, customize, spread on their own, um, that can go a long way, uh, right? So, um, you know, not not actually holding it so tight, and this is a great example of that, where people will go with these ideas and hopefully start in a thousand different places, um, take the message, customize for the audience, et cetera. Um, so putting those principles to work. I would say, though, that, you know, some of these movements that look organic really aren't. They have, they have bought really good talent. Um, for example, we're working right now with um, some folks trying to get the word out about, you know, how do we save cocaine-free contraception. We've got an amazing PR team that we've partnered up with, you know. So, but it, it isn't necessarily a huge amount of cash. I've been saying to Hunter we need to find some kind of rich backer who wants to back the comms piece of this. <laughs> I don't know that person, unfortunately. But, you know, a little, uh, I think if we could somehow marshal some resources and we could, uh, how we do that, I I don't know what the right answer is, but a little could potentially go a long way as well. So we'll we'll get there. We'll get there. But I do think that that point about message alignment, the, the left are also horrible at this. We hate all getting on one message. I did a big campaign with the UN around COP15. Um, it used a lot of the um, principles that we've talked about today. We turned Copenhagen into Hopenhagen, which was so cheesy it was good. And a lot of the nonprofits were like, we're not touching that. That's terrible. You sell out. And we got, you know, we completely hoovered up the share of voice around um, COP15 relative to other campaigns that were negative and doom and gloom and the earth is going to die and tick, 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 we're running out of time. So um, why did I bring that up? Why did I bring up Copenhagen? Oh, yeah. So we did manage to get some folks behind us, but most people didn't want to get on message with us. And we all know this, but that's what um, I'm just going to call them the right, are very good at authoritarianism if somebody sets a goal we all get in line and we follow and we're going to have to even if some of us don't like what the comms function here comes up with it's definitely better to get behind one thing than to be right to come back to your point so i think also if we marshal our resources and we collaborate there's a lot more folks that we all follow all of us than follow any one of us so that's also i think the unity piece and collaboration piece here will be super important 
And, and having worked for nonprofits for a long time, we're never going to have enough money. I, I, I'm not, I've worked for dinky nonprofits, and we thought if we just had a million dollars a year, we'd be able to win. I worked for massively large nonprofits, and we just thought if we had a hundred million dollars. The reality is, is that good, simple, clear, compelling messaging and staying on message is not about money. Every one of us can be better at that. Mm -hmm. So that's our big, yeah. that's a challenge. That's what we're trying to challenge all of us to up our game on. There's also some good stuff we can use, like tips and tricks. Like, for example, did, did anyone here see, there was a survey that came out a couple of weeks ago saying that 52% of men didn't, didn't um, think they should have to pay for birth control. I don't know if any of you guys saw that. But that was the data that was released through, we, we worked with a polling company, we did that poll, we got that great juicy data point, and the PR people got it covered on almost every um, earned media channel you could think of under the sun. So, you know, it's also thinking about how we make it, how we break through, how we make it sticky, what's our news, you know, all of those things are things that can also help with making the amplification happen. So we're going to have time for a couple more questions, just to be honest, because of because we have lots of other stuff and we want to give a chance for all of us to get a chance to talk. Um, so let's see, we're going to start with, uh, let's see, in the other side of the room, uh, back over here. Yes. Whoever, yeah, arm wrestle. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Dale Rothman at University of Denver. Um, one thing that struck me is on the slide that you talked about that showed the sort of left-right and where the um, media outlets are and where they fall on that. Is there something similar that actually shows where the audiences are? That struck me because I remember hearing something recently that in the US, NPR is considered very much down the middle in terms of what it produces, but in terms of its audience. It's not. Uh, that's a great question. I have not seen the slide that may or may not exist that correlates audience with the news outlets. What it really is, that slide was about journalistic bias. And, um, but I think that's a great point to bring up. Uh, my guess is it probably wouldn't fall too far you know, off. Um, but I would just be, I'm just making that up. Danya is going to make up something better. <laughs> No, no, um, I, there's, there is a, a lot of research being done, as you might imagine, <laughs> I think, on, on just that question right, right now in this, in this year. Um, I, was, I was just going to say an interesting piece on NPR. We engaged with them a few years ago on their branding work because, interestingly, to your point, they were struggling with their own best advocates, their deepest listeners were defining NPR as liberal. And why do you like it? Well, it's liberal. They literally didn't have the talking points to describe it, and they weren't helping when they were under attack with public funding, et cetera. And it was just, it was a very interesting exercise to be able to come up with a, their brand platform because they couldn't articulate for themselves what they stood for. They were so allergic to the idea of having a point of view that they, as staunch journalists, that they couldn't articulate that actually they did have a ferocious point of view. It was about being the agora for the people and and where all points of view could meet, et cetera. Anyway, it was just, it, it was a very, like we had to help them swing back from that left perception to, to do some of the things they were saying, like to, to be the place where everybody actually could go and feel comfortable and welcome, et cetera. Um, so anyway, just a, an interesting aside that they've all struggled with, with that themselves. So Hunter, you had someone you wanted to? Hi, I'm Ann Butterfield uh, with Clean Energy Action. Um, I have a brief comment followed by a question. And the comment is, I really thought that Hillary's slogan Love Trump's hate broke all the rules, you know, for framing and effective messaging. And I'm wondering if somebody would like to make a defense of that slogan, Love Trump's hate. Well, while they're thinking, I'm just going to tap dance. <laughs> Because they, I think you're probably better equipped to answer this, but the only thing I can say is that I was sad that it came so late in the game, you know. And uh, but then again, I don't know if that would have been a, an effective campaign sort of messaging strategy. Quite frankly, I think that the campaign messaging strategy 
um, was broken out of the gates uh, because what happened was Trump, you know, sort of built this vision as is, is awful as we sort of think it was, as terrible as we think it was, it was grounded in creating hope, right? Whereas Hillary's campaign was very much about her. In fact, it said, I'm with her. And, you know, but once Love Trump's hate came along, it did gain some traction. Yeah, no, exactly. It's interesting because of our identities and our points of view, I think we collectively thought Trump ran a negative campaign. We, actually, we just didn't agree with him, but he ran a very positive campaign to make America great again. She spent a lot of time on, on herself and I'm with her. And if you think about it, Love Trump's hate labeled hate. And that really wasn't being for something. There was never an articulation of what it was for. I do think she had the poo poo platter going on too. So we're going to do two more questions. Let's see, uh, Paul, in the way back. Wait just a second. We're going to get you on a microphone for those who are around the world. I saw this movie, Merchants of Doubt, that relates to a lot of this. And I want to know how we fight the merchants of doubt. Yeah, it relates to the money. And those were all the, this is the um, Naomi Oretsky, you know, it's all the same playbook from tobacco that they used on climate and our playbook is doubt, et cetera. You know, it goes back to the money. And I, I, the, the, the best answer is that um, I agree with you, Jeff, about being right because there's just a righteousness that comes with being right. But I, I will go to the mat for truth. And there is power in truth. Um, I, I, to me, that's a little different than being right. And so what we've tried to do, you know, the, then the playbook back on climate was amplify the lies. When they're lying, amplify the lies. And your money goes 10 times as far when you're doing that. Um, it, it, but yeah, you know, we need to find the, the, the deep pockets. And until we have it, we've got to be making sure that every dollar works 10 times harder. And I do think this is where the power of the positive vision comes in. Um, because we, it, it sort of relates to the love trumps hate thing. I mean, there wasn't, what was love? How, how were we defining love in that love trumps hate? We were defining ourselves again in opposition to, but we weren't painting that positive vision. And I think with the merchants of doubt, um, it has to be about that positive vision. What's the alternative vision that could become the compelling truth and the compelling story? So if they're telling us a story, we need our counter story. We can't just say, you're wrong, here are the facts. We have to have a, something much more emotive and compelling, I think. I just want to make one more comment on that, and that is, um, in my list, I said find an adversary. Uh, and in, in the particular case of the anti-tobacco campaign, which I think you worked on, um, the th what was communicated in, to youth at that point in time around truth is the notion of you are being lied to. And that was really, really important. And people don't like being lied to, and that really resonated powerfully. With a, with a youth audience. So I know there's a ton of questions. I apologize we're not going to get to them. I am excited that you're anxious to be able to have these questions answered. Um, Danie and Rob have been here, and you're going to be here all day. Shanka today, and Freya will be here for a bit. So, uh, and and let's reach out. This is something we need to get much better at. I have one. Because we've got a mostly conceptual question. I'm going to ask a tactical question you can use on Monday in case you have an email you have to send out or a message or something you're trying to communicate uh, to help us to improve our messaging. Can you talk a smidge about the value of focus groups and how do you actually validate messages? Because we have a tendency to read them, and when we think they're right, off they go. <laughs> well, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, where to begin on this? Um, I used to do branding work for Microsoft who believed that it had, everything had to be measured and what couldn't be measured was, I mean, it was like, wow. Um, polling, uh, you know, polling can mislead us. Some, this, this idea of polling, you know, we make so many presumptions going in that I think it's a very dangerous thing. I'm a big believer in, in early research, uh, which is just going and listening to people, being in their context, not out of context, doing true, deep qualitative research to understand what drives people and how they feel. And when you 
do the time, spend the time to get that right and then develop whatever messaging off of that, you are um, stand a much better chance. The problem with polling and things like that is they only show you the world as it is now. It doesn't show you the potential for what's possible in the future. So we, when we do our work, we look for inspiration. We look at the fringes. We look at hopes and dreams and get into people's houses and just talk and listen and then develop our work. And sometimes it is a leap of faith. We actually try not to kill a lot of stuff through testing because often they won't react well until it is in the world that you can, my God, if you get a thousand opinions, they can destroy any good creative. That's so, that's, that's my opinion. I was just going to say it's that I would 100% agree. It's the Gerald Ford thing, right? I hate to trot that one out, but if you'd ask people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So it's true. And the best use for research is that insight into that, the psyche of the person you're trying to reach that you just never thought of that unlocks that whole new way of looking at the problem. So. Um, we, at one of my agencies, um, you know, as Danya said, you know, focus groups are a great place to trash campaigns. Um, we got so sick of it that we finally just trashed focus groups and said, you know what, we don't, we don't need to do this anymore. Um, there's enough experts in the room and enough, you know, and it took a multidisciplinary approach to, to the messaging. The, the one thing I will add is we are in a different era right now. And what we can do is we can test messaging in real time. So we don't have to, right? So, I mean, this is just typical stuff you could do on Facebook or, you know, in any way, shape, or form. And that is what we do. Data science is really kind of the answer to yesterday's focus groups. So testing messaging, A-B testing, quick, you know, if you have 10 of them, you crank them out, you see what performs, and then the ones that perform, you just pour the gas on and you go. I would like to thank the three of you for sharing uh, your expertise in regaling us with inspiration and ideas. Thank you.